Hey, you, there's no chance you came tonight to hear the Brian and Brian podcast. Like, there's just no way. But if you wanted to come and hear Robbie Ray, Nick Ahmed, Alfonso Marquez, Ted Barrett, let's put our hands together for our Major League Baseball players and our umpires tonight as they come on out. See if they can round third base here. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a little bit more. A little more, a little more juice. Yeah, yeah. Hey, find your name on the receipt. Alfonso here, here. Ted here, Nick here, Robbie here. Man, Scottsdale Bible Church ain't playing around. We got names and microphones. We got like a batting order. Pretty impressive here. So by default, Robbie Ray, you get the first question because you're sitting by me. So, um, and I got the cool countryman rolling hot tonight. So, uh, Robbie Ray, you might know him as a Diamondback, right? Played for the Diamondbacks. Most recently at Toronto. Hold your applause till later, please. No, um, then, then a little Blue Jay for about a year and a half, but let's get, Blue Jays, okay. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we love Canadians. Yeah, we're good. Um, anyways, if you let me ask a question, no, okay, so let's get right to your off season, and I'll just say two words, Cy Young. So what do you got on Cy Young? What do you got? I, I guess they're just giving them out to everybody these days. Uh, you know, honestly, um, you know, more than uh, winning the Cy Young, the group of guys I was with this year just made it so much fun to come to the field. And, and the, the, it, was, it was more about being with the guys than it was about, you know, everything that I had, the personal uh, accomplishments that I had. Yeah. What's that like, though, to know you're pitching – you're pitching well, the media is talking about you. Even backstage in the green room, some folks were saying, man, if you have one more quality start, there could be some hardware in your, in your future. So getting that award, obviously you're a humble man. You're gonna, you're gonna give praise and honor to your teammates, your Lord, your beautiful bride. But like, what was that like when your, when your name got called? Uh, you know, my uh, six-year-old son actually stole the show, so. Uh, he's sitting right over there. It was uh, it was a pretty cool moment for him. He actually, uh, you know, they 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 called my name and and um, you know for me it was it was really cool. But it was really cool to see uh, my son Asher's uh, reaction to it as well because it, you know it was it was just like true joy hmm. and it was really cool for him and it was uh, you know it was a really cool experience for me as well. Yeah. Asher, if we can interview you, just let me know when we can uh, have you up here in just maybe about, about 17 years, right back here. We'll just, we'll just book you. We'll go through your agent first, though. So thanks, Ash. Appreciate that. Um, Nick Ahmed, down on back shortstop. We can cheer for that a little bit. Yeah. Nick. Nick, you've had some success. We're going to kind of go kind of down like kind of the accolade side of the baseball journey first. Talk about um, winning a gold glove, um, something that um, a lot of people would aspire to. Pretty sure only one shortstop gets that in the National League. It's not like a participation trophy. Um, so what was kind of that like? And uh, again, a lot of the hard work, the sweat equity, what was that like getting that award? Yeah, it was really special. Um, for a guy who plays shortstop, someone who's always loved defense, an award that I actually followed as a kid. Mm. Uh, most people just love to go out in the backyard and practice hitting and, you know, hitting home runs and going through the batting cage, but I actually love defense, mm. uh, unlike a lot of baseball players who just want to hit. So it was special for me, but like Robbie said, that I can't win an award, he can't win an award without mm. teammates, mm. Uh, without the coaching staff, without the guys in the front office doing their job to help me be in the best spot to make every play. So. Um, it's a team award as much as, you know, any other award is. And I'm just thankful to be able to have won a couple of them and help my team out every game. Yeah. So the game at times can go to a offensive slug, elevate and celebrate. So, um, you don't win one gold glove, you win two. Second one more special or just like, man, God, you're good. Like what, what does that look like to get something like that twice? Yeah, uh, the second one, I actually kind of wanted to win more. I think the first was like more of a surprise, and then my competitive nature kicked in. I was like, all right, I won one last year. I can go out and win another one, hopefully, if the Lord helps me stay healthy and, and keep doing what I can do. But it definitely wasn't something that I, I needed to have or anything to satisfy me. I knew the type of year that I had, and if it got validated with an award, great. But if mm -hmm. not, uh, I was completely okay with it. 
Since you mentioned your flesh, I mean your competitive issues, um, would you say, would you say, who's more competitive right now, Nick Ahmed or your beautiful bride Amanda? Who's more competitive? Oh man, I could tell some stories of some tennis matches and things that we've had. Uh, I think the most competitive in the family might be our oldest son, Jack. Um, you know, taking him to baseball practice and doing some stuff in the backyard with him. But uh, I guess the competitive juices just flow in our family. Love it, love it. Jesus, Italian, it's all, I mean, it's all in, it's all in the, the mix. Let's go to Brian Hummel right now. This, this event is so big time, you need two MCs. Yeah. So Brian Hummel, uh, been on staff with Unlimited Potential Incorporated. I would consider Brian a, a mentor in Jesus. Uh, Brian's the Diamondbacks chaplain, and Brian's got a few questions for our, our umpires tonight. Yes, uh, so these two guys, Ted Barrett, Alfonso Marquez, are some of the best umpires in the game. Uh, Teddy, how many years have you been doing this in Major League Love? Uh, let's see, I think this is my t 27th, 28th. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like How that. about you, Fonzie? This is my, sorry, <laughs> can you tell him I used to do this? <laughs> <laughs> this is my 23rd year in the big leagues. All right, here, let's make him feel good. Why don't you guys, no, 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 we need a boo. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, feels very good. Thank you, that makes us feel at home, appreciate that. <laughs> So, Teddy, you got all kinds of background stories. Uh, tell us a little bit about your boxing career. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I'm a better umpire than I was a boxer. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I grew up playing all kinds of sports. And, uh, yeah, I tried to uh, make a living boxing for a while. Didn't work out so good. But, uh, yeah, I got, got punched by a lot of, uh, lot oh, of good time. boxers. Yeah. yeah. And so, and the, and the players know that about Teddy. So, what's your guys' interaction with the umpires? How's that go? Yeah, Get. if you if you ever have anything to to say to Teddy, you make sure it's in the right tone. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because a young guy will come up, and I know the guy, the older guys, in the, are telling him, "Hey, you know, Ted used to be a boxer. Be nice to him." And he sparred with this guy, he sparred with that guy. And uh, one day, a young kid came out this year, and he asked me, "He goes, hey, is it true? Did you really spar with Muhammad Ali?" I said, well, "How old do you think I am?" <laughs> 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 the guys in the dugout are giving him some bad intel, but. Yeah, well, very good. Fonzie, tell us about your career path. What uh, was that like? You know, it's funny. I, I started playing baseball really late in, in life. I think I was 12 years old when I first got signed up in Southern California to play baseball. So I was always good enough to make the teams, even high school, but I never really played. But I'll make this story quick. I was 14 years old. I'm playing Pony League in Southern Cal one of the very few times that I actually hit the ball well. It was an inside the park home run at Amherst Park. Coming around second, I missed second base. So I'm in the dugout, they appeal to the one umpire that was working the game, calls me out, and I'm like, how did he see that? There's one umpire on the field, how did he see that? So I happened to run into him, Ken Avey was his name in the parking lot, taking off his gear. And I said, sir, can I ask how you saw that? Well, we trained for this, this is how we do it. Uh, we talked for a while and then I'm like, you guys get paid good money to umpire? And he's like, well, you know, we make this much and you know, we work <laughs> Southern Cal, you work year round. And I'm like, man, this would be a cool summer gig. So he's like, talk to your parents. If they allow you, I can go pick you up, take you to the meetings and get you certified and you can start working the little guys. And so that's how I became interested in umpiring. I fell in love with it. And the Lord has blessed me, and here I am now. That's awesome. Very cool. <laughs> Ted, one question for you. Uh, your, your bio is, is pretty amazing, but I want to take you to Game 3, World Series, 2018, Red Sox, Dodgers. Yeah. What do you got on that game? Uh, I didn't get paid overtime that night, but yeah, they, I think it was seven hours and 20 some minutes, which, uh, you know, I found out a couple things that night. I've never gone more than seven hours without eating. So, uh, you know, that's, um, one thing. And I, I've never gone that long without going to the bathroom either. I'll, but, uh, yeah, that was a long night, but, uh, you know, what a great game. What a, what a fun game to be a part of. And, uh, it was, you know, my parents, they're here tonight, um, that, that was my fourth World Series, and it was the first one they got to come to. It was the first time they came to the game, and 
Uh, they hung in there like champs, uh, but I told them they're not allowed to come to anymore. But <laughs> you know, so, no, it was great, it, and, and it, it was a uh, it was a cool experience. Um, but yeah, I was pretty tired the next day. I was pretty shot. And then, so that that game started one day of the week, ended the next day, and they had to come back for game four same day. Correct? Yeah. The, uh, the yeah the next evening. Luckily, we were on the uh, west coast, so we started a little bit earlier, and. Um, yeah, I think we got on the, off the field after midnight, turned around and played the next day. That was a quick turnaround, but, uh, you know, these guys do it all the time. You just, during the season, you just sure. uh, suck it up and go, go after it. So, so in Jesus' name, mom and dad, thanks for everything, but you can watch Ted on TV. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> okay, good, good. That, I, that, that would be a really good sermon right in there. Um, Robbie, let's go back to you, man. What was life like for you on this baseball journey pre Jesus. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, <clears throat> it was very selfish. Hmm. Uh, I was living life for myself, uh, personal gains, whatever, I, you know, whatever relationship, whatever um, thing I pursued, I did it for personal gain. And hmm. I did it, I only did it if it, it helped me get to where I wanted to be. And then what are some maybe uh, events that God used to, to say, wow, quickly, that that can be a, a hamster wheel or a roller coaster that's really hard to get off. Yeah, 2012 uh, was a pretty bad year for me uh, on the field. Uh, and, you know, before then I had a lot of success. Um, <clears throat> so I, I didn't really, you know, have that need for God. It was like, hey, I got this. And, uh, you know, then all of a sudden I have this bad year and then I'm shaking my fist at God. Hmm. And it was like, why'd you do this to me? And, you know, for me it was, uh, you know, a very eye-opening ex experience because, you um, you know, it was something that could be taken away from me like that. And, mm. and I saw that that could happen. And, um, you know, in that moment, I was like, all right, if I'm doing this, I'm doing this for your glory. I'm doing this uh, all for you, no matter what, whatever happens, mm. I'm giving it to you. Mm. So we have selfishness pre-Jesus. We have the interesting ability that probably everyone in this building has done at one time or another, like, God, if you're there, thanks, but I can, I can blame God. And then, and then now, what is life like now with Christ in your corazón, like, like Christ in your heart, Christ in your head? Like, I've got to know you the last couple of years, and you're, you're trying to really walk with Jesus daily. Yeah, I mean, especially with kids. I mean, kids, they soak up everything. Hmm. And so just being, <clears throat> excuse me, just being a, you know, the influence to them. I mean, I talked with Hamel the other day. It's like I, I'm discipling my children. Hmm. And, it, and I'm doing it in one of two ways. I'm either discipling, discipling them to follow Jesus or I'm discipling them to do something else. And so it's like, what, what do I want to do with my children? And I want, I want to disciple my children to mirror their life like Christ. Hmm. That's big time. I think that's worth clapping for, just saying. <laughs> Nick, kind of a similar um, question and answer with you. What's pre, what's, what's Nick Ahmed pre-Jesus? Yeah, so kind of similar to Robbie. I grew up, my parents took me to Catholic church, kind of drugged me out of bed on a Sunday morning and, um, you know, went kicking and screaming most days. Uh, made my parents late and all that, which they weren't too happy about. But, uh, you know, I ended up getting through high school without a relationship with God at all. It was mm. just go to church, do the right thing. And then once I left high school, I didn't have anyone pulling me out of bed on Sunday morning to go to church. Uh, so I went to college to play baseball, and it was just baseball, baseball, baseball all the time. Uh, I got wrapped up in my identity being a part of that, and it was me as a baseball player and nothing else. Mm. So I rode the success waves really well. The difficult times, like Robbie said, were really hard for me. Uh, and I just had this identity crisis all the time where I was so wrapped up in my success and performance and achievement that I didn't really know how to separate the two. Okay, and then you have a wild transformation story. I think it was during a minor league baseball game and King Jesus showed up. Yeah, so um, spring of 2013, uh, got drafted by Atlanta Braves. So spring of 2013, I got traded to the Diamondbacks. And I come over for spring training here. You know, it's a whirlwind, it's a new state, never been to, new organization. So I'm just trying to get my feet wet and get to know people. Camp breaks, I end up going to double A. Uh, our double A team at the time was in Mobile, Alabama. So my wife and I uh, were dating at the time, we're engaged actually. So we pack up the car, we're driving 28 hours, 
basically cross country. And she wasn't living with me at the time. She was in Massachusetts. Uh, so we were doing long distance relationship and she'd come down and visit at, at times. And I had a really hard time fitting in, right? Has anybody gone to a new place before or a new organization or a new school and they just had a really hard, hard time fitting in? Especially with a group of people that had been together before. That was kind of where I was at right there. So I struggled with that a lot. Struggled with the long distance relationship and I was definitely not treating Amanda the way she deserved to be treated. And then on the field, I started to encounter all this uh, terrible adversity. And kind of like Robbie said, I had a lot of success in my athletic career, but then at this point in 2013, I got hit in the chest real hard. Mm. And I was definitely the worst baseball player in the world at the time. Uh, two months into the season, I had about 200 at-bats. I played every single day. I'm not really sure why the, the manager kept writing my name in the lineup, <laughs> but I'm thankful he did. And uh, at the end of May, I was hitting 137. Uh, had one double, no home runs, and no RBIs. So for you baseball fans out there, don't, don't laugh too much, but uh, I was really, really bad. And so during that stretch, I would go home to my apartment every night, and I was living by myself. I would just stare at the ceiling, laying in bed with a ton of anxiety, just wrecked with worry and fear, and my identity was being ripped apart. And I had no idea how to process that. And I was scared, I was afraid that my dream since I was four years old was gonna get taken away from me. I had no idea how to process that failure and adversity. Uh, thankfully, I had a great manager named Andy Green at the time who uh, was discipling me just by loving on me through the game. He would invite me into his office, uh, and I thought I was in trouble for striking out four times the game before, but he just said, hey, man, how you doing today? And I was just kind of like taken back. And no one had ever asked me that before, especially a coach. So he loved on me and showed me what it was like to be a Christ follower in the game. And then during a Bible study, I heard this verse from James 1, 1 James chapter 1, verses 2, and 2 through 4. It says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, mm -hmm. right? And I was just doing life completely the opposite way. It was all about success and achievement. When the failure and adversity came, I was definitely not considering it pure joy. So I realized God had a different way to do life, mm -hmm. and my way of doing life was pretty terrible. So it was during a game uh, in Mobile. I go out in between innings. I think it was between the fourth and fifth inning. I just got out for the second time, and I was just so tired of, of doing life my way and ruining things and, and relationships. I turned around to face the outfield. Uh, I didn't take any ground balls that inning to warm up, and I just looked out to the outfield. I closed my eyes, and I prayed at that moment. I was like, God, I need you. I'm doing life the wrong way, and I'm going to do it your way from now on. And if you have baseball in my future, great. If you don't, that's fine. I'm just going to follow you with my life. So I gave my life to him right in the middle of the game and didn't think much of it at the moment. But uh, once I finally started to share that story with other people, they were like, wow, you need to talk about that more and share it. And just the best part about it is that God will meet you right where you are, right? With the thing that you love, right where you are, and he's going to come find you. And all we have to do is accept him. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, we can clap for that. I think in that, in that story, I've heard it three or four times, it never gets old, but also there was a point that you were sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that like when God reveals that we need him and that we have sin issues and he's the only one, your creator, that can, that can, that can heal you and meet you right where you're at. Last question for you, uh, what is life like now with Jesus ruling and reigning over your house, your home, and uh, man, you're, you're, you're spiritually walking with him. Yeah, I'll make this one a little bit shorter, but it's definitely a lot different. Uh, just wake up every day and knowing that I need God. Uh, my wife Amanda can attest that the days that I'm not really walking with the spirit, uh, I'm not the man that I'm called to be. So I uh, just try to submit to God every day and trust the Holy Spirit to guide me and give me grace to give other people grace and love on them the way that he's loved on me. Mm, that's awesome. Hams, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Uh, so Teddy and Alfonso, we all live in the same neighborhood together. So uh, we're neighbors. So during COVID, these guys were clutch. So we would go over to either Teddy's house or Fonzie's backyard, and we would talk Jesus, COVID, and cigars. <laughs> and it got us through it. Yeah. So th these, this friendship I have with these guys is really special. Um, in fact, my dog, I used to have a lab retriever. And he would run away from my house and run to Teddy's house because he liked Buster, his dog, and he had a pool. So he would text me, hey, I got Finney's at my house. 
I was like, let him swim, let him enjoy. I'll come get him later. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Teddy, a little bit about your journey. What, what led you to, what was your life before Jesus and what were the events that led you to Jesus? Well, uh, I come at it from a little bit of a different angle because uh, I was eight years old the first time I went to church and heard the gospel laid out for me and, and I was all in. I said, let's go. Nice. Um, and I enjoyed going to church. I didn't have to get dragged there. I, you know, it was, I was kind of a weird That's why kid, umpires you know? are better than players. No, it's, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the story takes a little turn. It's not, but, uh, so I'm going and, and then there was some things that happened in the church and, and we quit going. Um, football was king in our house. Me and my brothers played, my dad coached. And uh, so not going to church was not that big of a deal. Um, when I was in high school, I moved to California. Um, and I didn't know anybody that went to church, people I hung out with, nobody invited me to church. So there was this gap of, you know, where I was young and growing and uh, studying God's word and, and just growing closer to him, actually feeling God call me toward the ministry to like nothing. So I would still call myself a Christian, but I wasn't going to church. I wasn't reading the Bible. I wasn't praying. Um, and I got into college. I played football at Cal State Hayward. And um, the chaplain said, hey, uh, we're going to have chapel before the game. And I figured, well, I better go and really probably more of a, just a superstition thing or a good luck thing, but uh, this chaplain was actually on uh, campus for uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, and he invited me to lunch, and I said, hey, if you're buying, I'm there, um, and we started studying the Bible every week, and I was really going more for the lunch, but um, next thing you know, this guy's just discipling me, and, and it, it bought this, uh, what had been in me, this love for God's word, and just started coming out again, and uh, I was really enjoying it. Um, again, feeling this call toward the ministry, possibly, and but not really knowing what that looks like. I uh, get done with football at Hayward, and I go to Vegas. I'm boxing. Um, I'm getting bounced around the ring on a pretty, pretty regular basis, uh, but still, you know, God's putting people in my way there, uh, actually going to church there, and um, my dad, again, uh, he's here. He offered, he said, hey, if you want to go to umpire school, I'll pay for it, and I'm like, Five weeks in Florida? Yeah, I'm in. Thanks, Dad. Uh, so I go there and I get a job in the minor leagues, and I start out on that journey, but uh, still feeling a call toward ministry. So as I'm going through the minor leagues, uh, I make this deal with God, right? Anybody do that? He's kind of chuckling at you when you're up there. Hey, God, here's the deal. If I make it to the big leagues, great. If I don't, I'll go into ministry. And chances are I won't because the odds are ridiculous against making it. You know, there was a... Uh, Statistically, you have a better shot of being the governor of your state than making it to the major leagues because when we get there, we stay until we die or retire. Um, so we always joke, you know, when we hope a plane goes down, gets four guys. I mean, I know that sounds terrible, but we hope the whole crew's on there. <laughs> Fonz and I, we ride our Harleys to spring training and we see the minor league guys over there taking air out of our tires. And, you know, so it's just umpire humor. But, uh, <laughs> So I'm going through the minor leagues, and I had this deal with God. He's laughing at me. Uh, I make it to the big leagues. I'm like, okay, this is, must be where you want me, and now we're good. We can forget this ministry thing. Um, but the burden's still there. The call's still there. And eventually, uh, in a hotel room, I'm on my knees, and I'm like, okay, I surrender. I, I, you got it. I can't take this anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll go into full-time ministry. Okay, I said, but I'm going to do it under protest because I think it's a dirty trick. You called me and you got me to the big leagues and now you're calling me out and, you know, I don't want to preach and I don't, but, you know, I'll, I'll do the missionary thing maybe and now I'm bargaining with them. How about Hawaii? You know, they need Jesus over there. And, but so God's looking at me and he's like, my sweet, lovable, idiot child, uh, you, I do want you in ministry and I want you where I put you uh, as a major league umpire. And, you know, that's my encouragement to you guys. If you know, whatever you're doing for a living, wherever God's got you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in full-time ministry. So, I mean, when your alarm clock goes off in the morning and you go to work, it's mm. not just to go to earn a paycheck. You know, whether you're going to the clubhouse or um, you're going to that construction site or the office, I mean, you're there as a representative of Jesus. And so uh, th that was kind of an aha moment for me. Like, mm. he wants me ministering to umpires. He wants me uh, as a minister to, to, to professional umpires. So... The light goes on, and that's awesome. But then I had the oh crud moment. Like, how do we do this? I have no idea how to do this. Um, so I, I started taking some seminary classes. I thought I better learn a little bit about the Bible if I'm going to do this. Um, I'm working with Alfonso. We meet a guy through a friend of his, a pastor in Oklahoma. Um, and uh, 
Rob Drake comes to me at Major League Umpire now, and he says, hey, UPI is doing this retreat. We should go. So Rob and I go up in Prescott. I meet Brian there. I meet Tom Roy uh, with UPI. And it was great being at the retreat with the players. You know, we love the players. They love us. But, you know, sometimes it's like oil and water. So we thought, you know, we ought to do our own retreat. So I asked Brian, um, and I asked the pastor that we met. He got us a place up in Oklahoma. Uh, Brian came to teach. He got a guy to come up with a guitar from Houston to do worship. And we said, we sent out some emails, and we said, you know, it's a pretty good shot. There's only going to be four of us here, <laughs> but we'll have a good weekend anyway. Um, and there ended up being 12 umpires at that first retreat. And I was the only big league guy, and one guy just got released, you know, so it's like, okay, this is kind of a flop. But now looking back on it, um, and the one guy got tricked into coming, and he thought he was coming to do a clinic. <laughs> and uh, he ends up getting saved, and now he's a major league umpire, and he's part of our ministry. So um, another couple of those guys went into full-time ministry. Another guy became an attorney, does pro bono work for us. So hmm. looking back on it, I could see what God was doing. Um, and now next year we have our 20th annual retreat coming up. Uh, we had, we've had as many as 60 umpires there, and, you know, there's, there's 200 uh, minor league guys and 76 big league guys, so it's a nice percentage. Um, hmm. But, uh, you know, my encouragement to you, again, you're, you're in full-time ministry wherever you're at, and the Holy Spirit is going to show you how to do it. If Jesus wants you there and, and, and his, he's leading you to do it, he will provide the means. He'll put people in front of you. He'll give you the ability to do it. And... Um, Man, uh, Calling for Christ is our ministry, CFC. You'll see some of us wearing wristbands on the field. It says, Jesus loves umpires. And the, but the whole part of that is Jesus loves umpires because nobody else does. <laughs> Except our wives. Our wives are here. And sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> My mom sometimes. If, if get quicker games. But uh, uh. no, it, so we have the retreat, which Brian comes and helps at. We have... Uh, uh, not, not only that, we have a lot more guys involved. We have a, a prayer call once a week with the big league guys, a prayer call with the minor league guys. We have discipleship programs. We have um, uh, missionary trips. We tag along with UPI. We go to other countries and teach umpiring. So it's been really cool to think about this journey now uh, of the last 20 years. And, um, man, God's been so good. And, again, I hope that encourages some of you wherever you're, wherever you're working. You're in full-time ministry. Awesome. All right, Fonzie, I know your story, but these people don't. So give me like a normal day before Jesus as a major league umpire. What did that look like for you? A typical day. A typical day was, uh, well, I would, uh, back in the minor leagues, I would get to a city. Uh, I'd make sure that I'd run over to the liquor store and uh, buy enough beer to, to carry me through for two or three days. I was in that town. Uh, sleep all day. Go work a baseball game, uh, go to the bar, shut it down, come back to my room, and drink until I would pass out. And that was pretty much, I did that for, I tell people I only got drunk one time, but it was for 10 years. Hmm. So, hmm. pre Jesus, uh, yes, uh, uh, alcohol, anger, um, children. Uh, a lot of anger, um, hate, um, and everything was measured by by success in in umpiring. Everything was everything led back to that. Hmm. You know, everything was: Am I getting promoted? Uh, if I'm not, what a failure! Hmm. Uh, so everything was just negative. It was very dark. It was very dark and, and very, very dark. Hmm. All right, well then, where did the Jesus light start shining? Uh, it's, we always say this, right? We always say it's funny how God works in our lives, right? We, it's, it's a saying that we always say, uh, weird how God works in our lives, but it truly is. 1993, uh, you know, the dream was to umpire professional baseball. So I go to umpire school. Uh, I didn't have the means. I didn't have the money. But I happened to work a, a wooden bat league game with a gentleman by the name of Larry Callhorn. 
who was a very successful man in, in his career, uh, and he umpired as a hobby. So I meet this man, and I'm telling him my dream. I want to go to umpire school. He says, well, what's holding you back? Well, I don't have money. I don't, my parents can't afford it. I can't afford it. We had just gotten paid for a Little League game. He goes, well, here, start now. He gives me his check, okay? Fast forward, he loans me money, gives me money. I go to umpire school. Now I'm in the game. 1993, I'm in Arizona, uh, and we're meeting other umpires, and in comes this tall white dude, uh, very stocky, good shape, and it's Ted Barrett. Mm. <laughs> right? So I meet Ted, and one thing that I love about Ted is that, you know, when, when you meet a lot of people, you meet certain people, and say, hey, it's nice to meet you. And usually that's about it. Right? Maybe a question here or there. Not Ted. When Ted meets somebody, it's... He's here. Where are you from? I mean, it's, it's here. And so we spoke. It was at a bar, actually. We spoke for what seemed to me for a good hour and a half. And so we hit it off. We hit it off. Fast forward. Uh, his dream about uh, ministry. This Larry <coughs> Cawhorn, who helped me go to umpire school, uh, I invite him to come to Denver. We're working together on the same crew. We're in Denver, we're sitting there talking, he's sharing his vision. Larry Carhorn had brought his pastor from his church to this dinner, who ended up being our pastor for CFC. And so you start, I start looking back and it is amazing how God works. Little did I know that that gentleman that I met working a wooden bat league, uh, wooden bat game, just umpiring was you start connecting the dots. You meet Ted Barrett, you meet Pastor Dean, you meet, you get into baseball. And now here we are with, with CFC and uh, it was at CFC, uh, there's this awesome cross up on a hill at this ranch where we have our, our retreat that I finally get there one year and I am just so tired. I'm tired of the trying to fake people that I'm not, I'm no longer drinking. I'm no longer doing all these bad things. I am no longer, uh, you know, it was all just a, a facade. It was a, it was a mask and I was just so tired. I just remember being tired. Uh, my wife who was here, I mean, God bless her. She hung in through, I put her through some rough times when we were dating. And so I just remember going up to this cross and I remember just getting on my knees and finally just saying, I am tired. I am tired. And uh, like Nick said, I'm tired of doing this my way because I just keep ruining it. I keep ruining it. I keep pushing people away. I need help. I need help. I need you. Please help me. And it was from that day forward that I no longer had a drink. Uh, I gave my life, to, my life to Christ. As a matter of fact, I like showing this, but I ended up getting a tattoo of that cross <laughs> because uh, to, that, to this day, uh, I went up there, gave my life to Christ, and finally, truly surrendered and finally just said, I need help. I, I, I can't do this. Amen. And so life is no longer about uh, do I get the promotion? Do I get the World Series? Do I get the postseason? Uh, do people like me? Do, you know, do they think I'm a bad umpire? Now it's, it's, we go out there representing one, one person and it's God, right? It's Jesus. Now what matters to me is, uh, did I represent him well, right? Even when, when, when things go south on a baseball field, Maybe there's an argument. Maybe there's a, a confrontation. Did I represent Jesus while all this was going on? Uh, and, you know, the, the accolades and the, the World Series and the postseasons and the All-Star Games, those are great. Uh, but it's, it's at the end of the day, did I represent God and my wife and my family uh, the way I should be? Amen. That's, That's good. good. That's great. Thank <laughs> you.
New Testament, Acts chapter 4, 12, and 13-ish, um, Luke is writing and saying that they were unschooled and they were ordinary men, but people would take note because they had spent time with Jesus. So we've got some time left, and now we've heard the kind of how God grabbed you, how God revealed himself to you. What's the mindset now? Because now you're on mission, and you've shared that, right? The tattoo game is elite. The Nike shoe game is strong. I mean, I know that was kind of a double, like, look at the calves, look at the tat, look at the inkjet printer, and my Nikes are better than your Nikes. So um, we're going to roll back this way, Fonzie. Your wife already told me backstage you got like 19 nicknames. We'll keep it on the real. Um, but what is the mindset now? Like you just talked about, like, I want to represent him well, but Acts 4, 12 and 13 says, man, you're unschooled and ordinary, but people will take note when you spend time with Jesus. Talk about the mindset when you now go to work. Talk about the mindset when you're on a crew and maybe you get to be a light for someone on your crew that's not down with Jesus. Yeah, you know, again, the mindset today, before it was, I want to get to the big leagues, I want to get to the big leagues, it's all about the big leagues. Uh, I grew up Catholic, as most Mexican families do, and I used God, and when I, when I thought he gave me what I needed, I, I put him up on the shelf, right? I'll come back to you uh, if and when I need you. And so uh, everything was just, I want to get to the big leagues. I want to work that big game. I want to get, today, uh, again, God puts us where he wants us, right? So, uh, yeah, the hope was that I would become a crew chief someday, right? But the way I was headed, it was never going to happen. I'm lucky to even still be here, mm. truthfully. But uh, so God places me as in a crew chief role. The mindset today is, right, always lead by example, right? So uh, some of the guys that, that are coming up now to the big leagues, and if they get put on my crew, a lot of these guys knew the, the old me. And so uh, I want them to, to, to see the me today uh, always having Christ first and foremost, uh, letting Christ lead the way and just kind of following. Mm. And I want them to be able to come to me and say, hey, you know, which has happened. It's amazing that I never thought this would happen, but I had one guy come, come to me and say, man, there's, there's something about you. There's, there's a peace. When everything is just in this locker room, just there's that something peaceful about you what how, how do I get there right and then it's like oh let me tell you it's because because Christ is here mm. because God is here and there is peace in him uh, it doesn't matter what you're going through right oh, easy no but there is peace so mindset is I can't think of anything else other than than leading by example and then the thing that, that I struggle with today now is jumping at the opportunities. There's so many opportunities on a baseball field, in a locker room, on an airplane, uh, at an airport, uh, at a restaurant, to share the word and share the gospel and, and just share the good news, hmm. right? So uh, the mindset is that, that to try to jump at every opportunity and to be able to say the reason I am this way or, or that way is because of the man who died for me. Hmm. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. That's great. That's great. Ted, Ted, thanks for going to him. We're not. Robbie, what do you got on this? The mindset is you go to the yard, you're now at the Seattle Mariners, new club, new, new team. Um, what's the mindset for Robbie Ray uh, as a Christ follower? And um, I love the lead by example, but what else do you got on how you're living your life, bud? Yeah, uh, for me, <clears throat> this past year, uh, it was a really cool experience. Uh, you know, I, I felt like, for me, when I walked into the clubhouse, I said, I'm, I'm just going to make myself available. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put myself in a situation where I can just be there and, and listen to someone talk if they need me. Um, <clears throat> and it was, it was pretty amazing. Uh, I had multiple occasions where... You know, a, a teammate of mine that wasn't a believer would come up to me and ask me something about the Bible or about sin or about heaven and hell, mm -hmm. and it was and it was complete. It was nothing I did. I mean, I'm just sitting in a food room, 
eating my food, just making myself available for those conversations, just, you know, you know, walking in saying, Holy Spirit, if it's, if it's today, then I'm ready. And, and I, you know, on three separate occasions in a matter of a week, it was, you know, three separate guys that came to me that weren't believers, unprovoked. You know, it goes back to, you know, living your life um, as, as an example, like being the example of Christ to these guys. They knew that they could come to me in those situations and, and, and ask those questions because they had seen the way that I had lived out, hmm. you know, my daily life at the, at the clubhouse. But it was, you know, it was pretty, uh, it was a pretty cool moment. But, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just there. I'm there for my teammates. I listen and um, just make myself available for them. That's huge. That's huge. I think Ephesians 5.1 talks about being an imitator of God, Paul says. And so obviously you're also excelling in this ministry of availability, right? Um, that's great. How many Bible degrees do you have? How many seminary degrees you got? Zero. Zero. Oh, okay. So the ministry of, av 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 availability plays? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, God's going to use you again. God's going to use you where you are. And, you know, it, whether it's in the food room or in the clubhouse or out on the field during BP, uh, you know, in, in your office, uh, whatever it is, God, God can use you there. And, you know, it's being, having that availability and being there and being able to, to give an answer for those questions. That's huge. Nick, what do you got on this, bud? I mean, there, there's, throughout the season, we'll talk, we'll, we'll, we'll text, we'll have coffee together when you're in town, obviously. But what are some of the things that you do intentionally with trying to be like Christ in the clubhouse. Yeah, I love what Robbie said about the availability piece. I used to go to the field every day, and the, this was even me being a believer after I came to Christ. I was still on mission to be the best baseball player I could. And I think God calls us to do that, right? We have to show up to our work and our jobs and our lives and our families with excellence every single day and do the best we can. That's a prerequisite. That doesn't change when we, when we become Christians. But our identity doesn't lie in the result of that. So I would go to the park every day, and I had the blinders on, right? Anybody watch horse racing? All right, they put blinders on the horses so they can only see the one thing right in front of them, the racetrack. They can't see the horse on the left or right of them. And that's how I showed up to work every day. I had these blinders on where I couldn't see my teammate on the left. I couldn't see my teammate on the right. I had no idea what they were going through because I was just so focused on me and my routine and my preparation. And a couple years back, I forget even where I heard this analogy about the horse blinders, but I took the blinders off, right? There's still moments throughout the day where I have to focus and put some headphones on and, and really be present in my preparation. But most of the day I have the blinders off and I build in time for the availability, for the interruption. And one main thing I'll share too, this was two years ago, uh, three years ago actually. I would show up to the clubhouse at the beginning of the season and I was so eager to jump at that opportunity, like Alfonso was saying, so eager to jump at that opportunity to share the word of God with someone, to love on them, that I was whiffing, right? I was forcing it. I was trying to do it on my own strength. So I took a step back after a month, right? It was the end of April, first month of the season. I had zero meaningful conversations of any substance with any teammates, right? And I was like, man, God, I'm failing at this. I'm not doing a very good job. <laughs> so I took a step back and I started to pray before I went to the field every day. Right, I drive to the field, park the car, sit there in some silence, have a little silence and solitude, talk to God and say, hey God, I know you're working in the lives of my teammates and the people in this room. Show me where you're working, bring that opportunity to me and allow me to speak your word to them. So once I started to pray, it was unbelievable what happened. Seven days in a row, seven people came up to me, seven different people and had the, the most unbelievable, real, vulnerable gospel center conversations I had maybe ever. And when God was just hitting me in the face, he was just saying, hey, you, this isn't about you, right? You can't make this happen. This is about the Holy Spirit working through you and I'm the one working in these people's lives. So I just encourage everybody too, when you go on mission to your school, to your work, to your family, take a moment of quiet time beforehand and pray and ask God to show you where he's working and then you just show up and be available without the blinders on. Yeah, that's big time. That's huge. That's, that's next level discipleship right there. All right, all right, Teddy, Teddy Ballgame, Teddy Barrett. All right, so Alfonso is saying you have had a spiritual impact on, on his life. So we have, we have Paul, we have Timothy. What is that like to know 
that God is using you to be able to impact a younger brother in Jesus' name? Well, it's humbling, uh, but Alfonso's taught me a couple of great lessons. Um, number one, you know, when I met him and just something about him, an incredible story. I, mean, I wish I had time to tell the whole thing. I mean, humble beginnings. I've been to his hometown in Mexico, and it's, you know, it's, it's to, to be where he was, to become the first uh, major league umpire born in Mexico, and then to become a crew chief, uh, just an American success story, and I'm so proud of him. But uh, as he was coming up, you know, I saw some destructive behavior going on. And, you know, so in my mind, I was like, I got to save him. I got to save him. You know, I'm, what do I, I'm going to grab him. I'm going to dunk him and baptize him. I'm going gotta, <laughs> gotta, to gotta, beat him into the kingdom. I'm not, i got to do something. But, you know, the reality is I, I can do nothing to save a person. I mean, I'm a pretty good umpire, but I'm, I'm a terrible savior. Um, but uh, I had to get out of the way. And, you know, it even came to a point where I was like, all right, you know what, I'm done with you. And it, it was almost instantaneous as when I did that, Jesus just moved right in and started to do a work in him. And so I learned such a valuable lesson through him. It's like the best thing I could have done for him was pray. I think I was trying to do everything else. And so, you know, I encourage you, if there's someone out there that, you're, that, that God's given you a burden for, I mean, just pray for him. Uh, because the reality is we can support, we can love, we can encourage, but we can't save. Only Jesus can do that, and he did that in his life. So, and, and then the other thing is that I'm so, uh, he's my best friend, and I'm so thankful for him because, you know, even though uh, I've been following Jesus a long time, if I get real honest, and maybe you guys would too, is, so, you know, you get those deep, dark nights that maybe sometimes doubt creeps in, and oh, maybe just me, I don't know, but... Um, you know, when I look at Alfonso, I'm like, I know God is real because I had a front row seat to him performing a miracle. I mean, he took a, he took a, a broken man and just made him whole. And um, it, it's amazing. And only God can do what he did in his life. And, and I know he's just a one story in a million people, but I, I saw it so intimately that I, I know it's real. I know the Holy Spirit did that. I have no doubt in my mind. And so I cannot doubt the existence of God. I can at all. I, I can't explain him. I can't get my mind around it. Frankly, I don't want a God I can get my mind around, but I know for a fact that God exists because of him. And so uh, it's, it's really a cool, cool friendship uh, that we have. So that's my sermon. Mm, yeah, that's it's good. good. It's good. What's our time? Um, We're good. You doing good? We're good. That clock, that clock thing right there? Yeah. What does We're that good. tell me? Oh, is that ticking down? Mm -hmm. I just now realized that. Shot clock. Yeah. Um, so as you guys, is there like a, a Bible verse of some level that like, hey, man, this really ministers to me or a, a passage in Scripture that you kind of find yourself connected to that you like? Uh, you want to go first, Nick? Sure. Uh, this is kind of more of a chapter, um, something that I've read several times before, but uh, doing a reading plan that um, some guys at UPI put together this year, just going through the Bible in a year. And yesterday, I come to Matthew 27. And for those of you uh, needing some inspiration as to who our Savior is and what he has done for us, uh, look no further than Matthew 27. And just knowing that everything that he went through, Jesus voluntarily stepping down from heaven, putting on human flesh, coming to this earth, being accused of things he didn't do, convicted of things he'd never even come close to doing, after living a perfect life, right, then he endures being whipped, being spit on, being mocked, being beaten, crown of thorns on his head, and then nailed to a cross for us. It just absolutely blows me away every time I, I read that, and I know that as I walk through my everyday life, but I think we all just continually need that reminder of who Jesus is, right? He is love, and he is sacrifice, and he is the way to life. And just when we come to him and when we understand everything that he's done for us, it's just so powerful. It changes our perspective when we go through things. It helps us to love people who seem unlovable. Uh, so I'd encourage everybody, if you never read it, go to the book of Matthew. Look at chapter 27 and just see the unbelievable sacrifice and payment for our sins that Jesus has done for us. That's good. I don't think anybody's going to do a better verse. No. I do have one, uh, <laughs> though, that's... Kind of quirky. So let the peace of the Lord rule in your heart. And actually the Greek word there is uh, loosely translated as umpire. Yes. So that's kind of, it's kind of our life verse. <laughs> Jeez. So 
When you guys yell at umpires, you know that uh, Jesus doesn't like that. But no, it's uh, a... <laughs> but I love that verse because, right? Let the peace rule in your heart. Yeah. I mean, when there's peace, uh, I, every time I try to make a decision, I'm praying, you know, is this what you want, God? And mm-hmm. when I feel that peace, I know that's the umpire. It's making the call. So, <laughs> yeah, a lot that's better great. than I do. So That's awesome. Robbie, you got... Yeah, I, I think for me, uh, I believe at Matthew 5, 16, uh, you're a light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. I think for me that, um, you know, that's what we're doing every day in the clubhouse. It, it's, it's letting my light shine so, and, and not hiding it, not, not putting on, uh, you know, these, a, a lot of the guys in the clubhouse are not believers. And, and so for me, it's like, I don't want to, you know, fall into, uh, you know, the same lifestyle or, um, be a bad example for those guys. And so it, it's a really slippery slope and it, and it can happen quickly because we're all human. Yeah. And so for me, um, you know, that verse, being a light to those, those guys in that clubhouse um, and, and to just everyone around me, I think it, it just really hits home for me. It's hmm. good. Fonzie, you got something? Yeah. Uh, as you well know, you know me pretty well. I'm terrible with names. I, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe I burned too many brain cells, but uh, I'm going to mess up the story, but thankfully my brother is here to help me. We he's were, got his PhD in theology, so he yeah. should be able to help out. No, but my, we were together on the field when this happened. And Joshua one night is, is yeah. the answer. But we're in Toronto, and third baseman for Baltimore. Yeah. Tony Bautista. Bautista. <laughs> uh, he seemed to be kind of out there sometimes. Before the game would start, he'd act like there was a deep very high fly ball, and he was going to catch it right just before the game would start. But anyway, he's up to bat. Mike Winters has got the plate, and <laughs> Winters asked him something, and all Bautista kept saying was, Joshua, 1-9, Joshua. In Spanish, though. Uh, yeah. Yeshua. Is Yeshua. <laughs> yeah. And so Mike Winters was like, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Which made me go back. And because I always that always stuck with me, so I went back and, and read it right now. Again, if, if you read Joshua 9, right, we're commanded to not be afraid, right? But you take it to those that specific time in the Bible, it, it, it has to do with completely something different. But I we can take a verse and apply it to our everyday life, right? Mm-hmm. And so when this gentleman. Uh, Larry Cawhorn was very sick in the hospital just before he died. Uh, I sent him just a quick little note, and I said, Joshua 1-9, mm-hmm. right? Don't be afraid. He's commanded us to not be afraid. If we're living in him and with him, we shouldn't be afraid. And so that's what I, I, I hold on to, right? Mm-hmm. You can take that verse and apply it to every single thing in your life uh, to the point where uh, now our daughter believes in, 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 not believes in it, but goes by that verse a lot. Uh, because we're always gonna encounter things that are, might cause, cause us uh, anxiety, fear. Um, but I always, I always think about that. Uh, yeah. He did command us to not be afraid and right. he is gonna be with us in everything that we do. And so that's, that's where I go. That's good. That's good. A uh, couple, couple last closing thoughts here before we wrap up with the fellows here on stage. Um, just from before you leave, uh, make sure there's some tales from the dugout, giveaways, goodies, things like that. So before we bounce out of here, make sure you um, check in the lobby there. Hugh Wilsley, Jason Zavetti, the entire tales from the dugout crew. Uh, just thanks for their hard work and, and just Scottsdale Bible Church hospitality for putting on this event. So I want to give a shout out there. Um, one last thought. Homs, you are way too godly of a Jesus cat on this stage to not share your favorite Bible verse. Or you could be like Nick and just do a chapter if you want. You know? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to do two chapters because I'm competitive as well. No. Um, you know, uh, one of the cool things is, is uh, and I don't know about has got a cool story as he meets with the king each day in the in his closet, I meet with the king each morning in my closet. And uh, the last thing I say before I walk out of that closet after I've spent time with 
the king in prayer and, and meditating on his word is Psalm uh, 16.3, keep me safe, O Lord, for you are my refuge. You know, and that I fix my eyes upon him. He's the author and perfecter of my faith. Uh, even though I'm a, we're both collectively a paid professional follower of Jesus Christ, uh, we need Jesus as much as anybody on the planet needs Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so learning to walk so near to him, to trust him, to be intimate with him, it's the greatest privilege that we can have. The things that Jesus went through is, as Nick talked about in Matthew 27, he endured the wrath of God as the lamb of God to give us access to God. And I don't ever want to take that for granted. To be able to meet with him is the greatest privilege of my life. And Jesus wakes me up each morning, and I go right into that closet, Mm. and I commune with the king. And then I see what my assignment is, and I go and I do it, hopefully, every time, you know. But, yeah, just, just spending time in the word, spending time in the closet, spending time in intimacy with him. Yeah, we can... We got Nick. Can I throw something in? Please. Um, so these guys up here have taught me a lot and have discipled me, right? And I think we're called to go and make disciples, right? And the next chapter after Matthew 27 is Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. And so what does that even really mean? So we just started a Bible study, uh, the UPI guys did, Brian Hommel and his staff, for all major league and minor league baseball players and their wives. Uh, just started last week. It goes every spring training. We actually have one of them here and one of them out in the west side of the valley. Mm-hmm. But what we're going through this year is something that's so impactful and I think everybody needs to know and understand is that being discipled and being a disciple of Jesus isn't just knowing scripture and isn't just being able to say I go to church or isn't being able to say whatever. It's actually living the way and the lifestyle of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Right? So in the beginning, the first followers of Jesus after he died and rose They weren't called Christians. It was called followers of the way, right? And so when I say that and I hear that and I read that myself, it's the way of life. It's how they lived. So being a disciple is following in the footsteps of Jesus. So the whole Bible study we're going through right now is looking at Jesus, how he lived his life, and trying to pattern and copy our lives around that. So it's not the way of the world, it's not the the rushing around, the hurriness, the busyness, the competitiveness of our culture that seems so predominant these days. It's slowing down, it's taking time away, it's meeting with the king like Brian and and Brian do every morning in your closet. It's going out and loving on people really well. It's slowing down, it's just having these priorities and living the lifestyle that Jesus lived, not just the values and morals that he had. So when you guys open your Bibles, um, whether it's for the first time ever or it's the, you know, whatever, you've been doing it for 50, 60 years, look at Jesus and how he lived life and try to copy that. Because for me, that's when the real transformation started to happen in my own life is when I started to try to live my life how Jesus lived his life. Not just memorizing scripture, and that is good, but living how Jesus lived in his day-to-day life. And it's hard because we all have phones and technology and jobs and families and things that take our time and attention away from it, but bring Jesus into that and then slow down and try to live the way he lived. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's huge. Yeah. I know there's obviously folks here in the auditorium listening and and celebrating what God's doing in these men's lives. There's also folks being able to, to catch this, whether that's a live stream or can go into a replication or a duplication of tonight. Um, I'll say one thing, and then Nick, I'll kind of give it back to you to kind of close us up before we give it back to um, Jason and, and the Tails guys. Um, as I'm a former TV sportscaster, and so statistics would just rule the world in stats and highlights and na 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 But also <laughs> this idea that... Um, this, this idea that, especially in baseball, analytics are, they're everywhere. Here's one thing I learned when I came to know Jesus. And it was a stat. And it's one out of one people pass. And it was one of those things that just kind of my, my, my memorization of, of Bible verses or statistics just, just was like, wow, like, God, You don't need us, but you choose to use us. And one out of one people pass. And so we're not going to let tonight go. And I know Nick would like to share a few thoughts on just 
if someone wanted to give their heart, life, soul to Jesus, that you men have all said you've done at different times in your journey. Uh, Nick, maybe just walk us through there as we close up tonight. Yeah, sure. Um, so someone told me this recently. I actually forget who it was, but the way churches have operated and gone the, the past, you know, several generations here, especially in our country, is that people come up on a stage, a pastor comes up, talks about the word, and then invites people to become a follower of Christ. And I think that is great, and I think that's phenomenal how we're doing things and leading people to the Lord that way, but it's much more than that. So the biggest thing God wants from each and every one of us, every one of us up here included, is he wants a relationship with you, right? He doesn't care how good or bad you've been. He doesn't care what you're going to do for him in the future. He wants your heart. And that's what Jesus came here to do. He came here to have a relationship with us, show us the way to live, and bring us to the Father, like Brian said earlier. So the thing about us, right, one and one are going to pass, but each and every one of us here in this room, I'll be the first to admit, we've all fallen short. We've all made so many mistakes in our lives, right? I have three young kids. Two of them were here. I think they had to get home for bed and left. But I see it raising my kids all the time, right? We're born with sin, right? It's not something I have to teach my one, one and a half year old daughter right now is to sin. She says, mine, 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 basically with all her actions and she hits her brothers and does things she shouldn't do, right? We've all done that. We've all messed up. We've all done things we shouldn't have done. And I do it all the time as well, especially when I'm not walking with the spirit each and every day. So what happens, right? We all sin, we all mess up, we all fall short. Does that mean God's mad at us and he's gonna accuse us of our sin and when we go face him one day, he's gonna condemn us for those things? The fact is no, if we put our faith in Jesus, right? So Jesus loved us so much and I talked about it through Matthew 27, everything that he did for us was to take the punishment that we deserved upon his shoulders, right? We all deserve to be punished for our sins. For me as a father to my children, I would be a very bad father if I let my children go undisciplined and unpunished for the things that they did wrong, right? So God's the same way. He's a fair and he's a just and loving father. So he has to punish things when they're wrong, right? And instead of us being punished for our sin, Jesus said, no, no, no. I love these people too much. I'm going to come here and take that punishment for them, right? So if you guys haven't heard that before or don't quite understand that, I want you guys to just think about that and meditate on that. And if God's calling you right now to himself and you feel that tug, that's probably the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, you've kind of been living life one way. I want you to live it this way. And I want that relationship with you. So let's go ahead and pray right now. Everyone bow their heads, please, with me. And we're just going to ask God to come here in this moment and speak to us. Heavenly Father, you're just such a good father, a loving father. And we just praise you, first of all, and thank you for the opportunity to be here in this place, to talk about you freely uh, with everything going around in this world. Uh, we don't take that opportunity lightly, and we just want to ask, and um, if there's anyone here in this room that feels that tug of the Holy Spirit, uh, I don't want to make it an overly spiritual or uh, ritualistic process, but God, if you're tugging that person, I pray that you would confirm that with them and that they would know for sure that you love them and that you're calling them to yourself. So, Lord, you tell us in your word that we all fall short and the punishment of sin is death. But your son Jesus took on that punishment for us, and we thank you for that. And if anyone here in this room wants to make that decision right now or make that decision later tonight, we ask that you'd help them to do that. Continue to draw them to yourself. And we just want to follow you, Lord. So if anybody needs that decision made right now, don't make it complicated. Just call on the Father and say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I'm putting my ways aside and I'm going to live life the way you called me to live it. And if that's you uh, and you need someone to help disciple you and work with you, we just ask that um, the Father would put that person in your path like we've talked about here, like Alfonso was saying. That God, you're so good at that, just orchestrating people to move in and out of our lives and just bring those people into those people's lives to disciple them and lead them and teach them all about following you. So God, we love you so much. We thank you for this night and we just worship you and praise you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, let's put our hands together for Brian Hommel, Alfonso Marquez, Ted Barrett, Pastor Nick Ahmed, and Robbie Ray. 
j j just one more round of applause for all of our guests tonight as they're exiting the stage. Just want to thank you uh, again. Thanks, Scottsdale Bible Church, for their hospitality. And uh, reminder again, I don't think you'll forget, but if you have one of those nifty little tickets, uh, go ahead and collect your signed item in the lobby on your way out. And with that, uh, we are done this evening. Um, please drive safe. God bless. And good night. Let all my life tell of who.